KPBS reporter Joanne Farian has been busy these days tracing the food we eat back to the farm, the field, ocean, and factory. She's learned that industrialization and our demand for a big, juicy, and cheap steak has created corn-fed, hormone-injected, fast-growing cattle. These are animals that travel thousands of miles and through many handlers before arriving at your local grocery store. So Joanne joins us now to talk about her report for Envision San Diego. Welcome, Joanne. Thanks, Gloria. Why are you working on this project? Well, we wanted to find out, could we actually track our food? Um, California is the number one agricultural producer in the country. Uh, agriculture is a big part of San Diego's local economy. So we asked a number of questions. and. In, with regard to beef, we asked, when I go buy a steak in the grocery store, can I track that steak back to the ranch? And can you? No. Oh. We honestly didn't know what we would learn when we asked that question. You can track the steak to the packing plant, but from the packing plant to the rancher, it's like putting together a puzzle with pieces missing. We actually have no federal tracking system in this country. Why, why is it important to be able to tr track our beef supply back to the source? It, it really becomes a safety issue for one because you want to know if there's some sort of contamination. You want to be able to find the source. And from an industry point of view too, if they have uh, cattle that's sick, you want to know where it originated and then you can go right to that ranch and, and, and correct the problem. Uh, right now, th they do it, obviously they do it, but it becomes this very intricate looking at all the different pieces with the magnifying glass and trying to piece everything together. So we do have a clip about the need of tracking in the cattle industry. Here's a, a cattle rancher from El Centro. His name is Bill Brandenburg. For the cattle industry itself, we need a tracking system to track each animal that we can identify each animal, track them, uh, so that if we do get any disease outbreaks in the country that we can trace those back, or if there's any other problem you know, at the packing house or whatever, that we can trace everything back to its origin and get answers. And I, to me, I'm in favor of that. I think that that's very important for us and it's something that's overdue and it should have been done a long time ago and people are just resisting it that are afraid of government interference in their business. And I mean, we've got, every other regulation in the world that we have to deal with. It's burdensome and that's one that would actually help us. So is, is government resistance the reason that beef isn't being tracked or well, other reasons? According to Bill Brandenburg, there's a couple other reasons too. I talked to an animal sciences professor up in Pomona and he said, you know, we've got 50 states with, with 50 different sets of laws. We're a large country, very diverse. So it makes having one big system of tracking to put that in place would be very difficult. But I want to tell you, Japan tracks their beef. Uh, countries in Europe track their beef. I mean, it is done. Well, let's get into it then. How physically different are the heads of cattle today than they were years ago? Well, first of all, they're bigger. Um, they're about 300 pounds heavier than they were a generation ago. Um, they're fatter, um, and one of the reasons they're fatter is they eat corn. What you're seeing right now, so those are cattle, they're, they're young cattle, and they start off eating grass. Uh, yeah, for about six months in Southern California, they'll live the way uh, they, that you see on the screen right now, where they're, they're grazing. After about six months, they're sold to someone else in another state because we don't have enough grass we don't have enough water uh, where they'll graze another six months on grass and after that they go to the feedlot and that's when they start to eat the corn that's when they start to get they also are given hormones to make them fatter juicier and bigger so what are, what are the drawbacks to this? So they're, they're bigger, they're in feedlots, they eat corn. What's the problem? Well, it seems as though one thing leads to another. When we started feeding them corn in the 60s and the 70s, and we discovered, oh, they get bigger and they're juicier, isn't this good? Well, uh, when we started feeding them corn, we also realized it's too much fat. They don't have enough lean muscle tissue. So in order to make more lean muscle tissue, we started giving them hormones because it helped them make that muscle tissue. We also discovered that, well, corn's a bit tough for them to digest, so we started giving them microbials in their feed as well. When we put them on feedlots to feed them all together, it was also learned, wow, you have one sick animal, 
all of them will get sick if they're so close together, so we give them antibiotics. So you see within the chain one unintended consequence after the other. Well, we're going to learn much more about this because Joanne and a team of KPBS reporters are tracing the food from your dinner plate back to the farm field and ocean. And you can see those reports on our website at kpbs.org slash food. There's a special, it's called Envision San Diego Food, and it airs November 16th at 9 p.m. on KPBS television.